the last part of this kind of introductory motivating <laughs> section is um, I want to say some few words about spatial econometrics or spatial regression analysis and uh, primarily um, some definitions and I like to do this in a little bit of a historical context and also to illustrate how things have changed and where spatial econometrics came from originally was very applied and it has evolved and nowadays it's much more rigorous, much more theoretically uh, based and it's actually part of, uh, increasingly part of what mainstream econometricians work with and several uh, theoretical econometricians are working on spatial uh, problems uh, these days which was not the case 20, 30 years ago. Um, the Jean Palink is the one who coined the term spatial econometrics in the early 70s and um, it came out of uh, regional modeling really. The, the need um, to model regional econ economies in, in Europe uh, there were no time series. The, the, the common market was fairly young. Uh, there were very good regional data, but with very short time series. So rather than the traditional macro type of approach, which is all time series oriented with lots of data over long periods of time or very frequent measurements, here we had a situation where the cross-section became very important. So there was a, 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 a change of interest, if you wish, of at least some set of regional applied economists to try start thinking about problems of spatial autocorrelation and how that affects how you model and how you estimate and how you test. So in, in this book at the, in 1979, this is called Spatial Econometrics, um, five major, major aspects were pointed out the role of spatial interdependence, we already mentioned that. Asymmetry, and we'll talk about that later, that not, um, there's not necessarily a symmetry in the spatial interaction. Um, the importance of scale, the way they put it is the importance of factors in other spaces. So not just a single container, but things interact over space. Um, importance of space time before and after. And Behind everything, the requirement that we can't just assume spatial effects away or somehow, you know, vaguely put them in some uh, error term in some unspecified fashion, but we need to explicitly model space and bring it into our models at every stage of the analysis. So then, about 10 years later, when um, what I call the Red Book came out, which is the Spatial Econometrics book, um, I basically thought of this as from a regional science point of view, still primarily driven by regional economic concerns and um, focusing on what made spatial data different in regional science models, models dealing with uh, economic convergence, with spatial interaction, accessibility, those types of things. Um, and there were two parts of this. One part was the data, the other part were the models. So what were the problems caused by using cross-sectional data that are spatially correlated? How do we deal with this? That's one thing. Another thing is how do we bring spatial interaction into an economic model, into an econometric model? How do we put this into an equation, which is the model-driven part? And the... Um, the basic framework that we use for this is to distinguish between spatial dependence and spatial heterogeneity and we formalize each of these and they will be present in our tests, in our model specifications, in our estimation. So this will be a theme that we will keep following. Um, the problem is that it's sometimes, I should say often, very difficult in a pure cross-section to tell one from the other and then we'll keep encountering this as we proceed with our models. And then um, quite a bit later, almost 20 years later, um, spatial econometrics has arrived, so to speak. It is a subset of econometric uh, methods, 
It deals with both cross-sectional and increasingly panel data, space-time data. Um, it deals with explicit treatment of location, distance, spatial arrangement. Four major aspects, model specification, estimation, diagnostics, and prediction. So it has matured rather than some ad hoc fixes, if you wish, to deal with data problems or deal with particular model specifications, it's become a much more mature field where still spatial dependence and spatial heterogeneity are the drivers, but they uh, come out in four major areas of application. And increasingly, as I mentioned, this is part of mainstream uh, econometrics. These, this evolution, you know, it's spanning more than 30 years but it's been exponential with a very rapid acceleration in the last five, um, five to ten years. And basically, I see this coming from two different uh, sides. One is the theory. And there has been a shift in economics and sociology, political science, from dealing with individual agents, if you wish, in isolation, to dealing with the interaction between the agents, social interaction, social networks. Um, the recognition that social interaction has a spatial imprint, a recognition of the importance of neighborhood context in a number of phenomena. This comes from the theory. This is not from the applied work. These are theoretical frameworks that then, of course, require some form of empirical verification, some form of calibration, so that's where the techniques come in that uh, allow us to estimate a model for spatial social interaction and, and to implement this in practice. Another theoretical framework is a little more technically, is this notion of common shocks, is that if you model phenomena, um, the agents are um, exposed to common unobserved phenomena, uh, you know, things in the stock market, uh, weather changes, um, military conflict, uh, strikes, these kinds of things that are often very difficult to measure, but they're shared by a number of agents. And because they're shared, these agents have commonalities in their behavior that somehow need to be modeled. And this is a framework of common shocks that is um, deals with spatial in autocorrelation, if you wish, in the error term. And that's, a f again, comes from a formal theoretical framework that then requires implementation in, in practice. So that's the theory driver, if you wish, of, of the interest, the growing interest in spatial techniques. There is also a data driver, and I already alluded to geocoding and georeferencing. Um, much more information this day and age is geo-referenced than used to be the case. The technology has changed tremendously. A global positioning system, a GPS, used to be this you know, $20,000 backpack that you had to carry around to find a location. Nowadays, it, it fits in a watch. It fits in your cell phone. So it's basically a tiny device. It's, it's very cheap. It's easy to georeference anything. If you do surveys, you just click on the GPS. You know exactly where you are at what point in time. It allows a, a realistic analysis of a lot more phenomena than used to be the case. Uh, you may be in, uh, aware of this notion of a space-time prism, for example, in geography. It's you know, where people go at what point in time. You know, where do they go shopping? How do they arrange? their work trips versus their shopping trips and school trips and dropping kids off at daycare, all these kinds of things, has both a, a time imprint as well as a spatial imprint. The way this was done in the past was with diaries. People had to write down what they did and where they were. And of course, it's in, inaccurate. People don't remember correctly or take shortcuts. Nowadays, you stick them with a the GPS and you know exactly where they are at any point in time. And it really has exponentially increased the amount of information to look at space-time phenomena of various kinds. 
the types of sensors that are available, the precision of the sensors has just increased tremendously. Um, you know, QuickBird, for example, has um, resolution up to half a meter. You know, these are the kinds of things where you can get realistic pictures from satellites. Um, you know, Google Earth is another example where you get incredibly uh, precise spatial information readily available um, if you can overlay it with maps, with various things. And this kind of overwhelming amount of georeference information requires the proper techniques. And as I sh alluded to and illustrated earlier on, if you use non-spatial techniques, it doesn't matter. But if the where, if the location matters in what you're interested in, then you have to use techniques that take that into account. And they, those are the spatial techniques. The other driver is uh, software. I mean, the, do the desktop GIS and nowadays the internet GIS has made doing these types of operations very accessible. I mean, it used to be, uh, to, to get a map made, you had to have a professional cartographer who hand drew the map. With desktop GIS, you can generate you know, literally hundreds of maps just by pointing and clicking, and they're all good maps. With web GIS, you're able to combine data from a one location with software in another location and map information in yet a third location, put it together, through a browser interface that anybody can use anywhere in the world. And this kind of change has driven a demand for more and more analytical techniques. I mean, whereas just making a map used to be a really exciting thing, now you start asking questions of the map. Say a crime map of, of, uh, that you can see on the web on a weekly basis, this is all very nice, but what does it mean? Is there some pattern here? How do we quantify this pattern? How do we relate this pattern to other factors? So this drives a demand for more and more sophisticated spatial data analysis techniques, and specifically also spatial regression techniques. Um, and as I already alluded to, um, basically I see this as categorized into four major dimensions, and we'll uh, focus on three of these in this workshop. The one that we will not focus on is the last one, spatial prediction. Uh, why? Because we will focus primarily uh, on what is called lattice data, which are discrete spatial objects, such as census tracts, provinces, counties, either represented as their boundaries on a map or represented as points. It doesn't really matter. What does matter is, as I mentioned before, is that they exhaust the space and that they're discrete as opposed to being continuous surfaces. So we will focus on three aspects of this. Um, how do we specify the spatial interaction in a regression model? That's what we'll do tomorrow. Then how do we know whether this is e really worth bothering with? How do we test for spatial autocorrelation? How do we assess what kind of spatial autocorrelation it is and what kind of models we need to implement and then how do we estimate these models. Um, one of the things that we'll see is that standard approaches do not work. Um, the spatial correlation is two-way, it's simultaneous. The simultaneity, the feedback, and as I'll put it later, I am my neighbor's neighbor, so I influence my neighbor, but my neighbor influences me, and how do we disentangle that? That kind of complication requires explicit different techniques from the standard uh, techniques. And it's also very important to know that spatial analysis is not just time series analysis in two dimensions. There is a qualitative difference between the two. Okay, short break battery. Don't go away. Well, just take a minute and then...
Uh, we'll take a break in about 20 minutes. Just the camera ran out of juice. Okay. So um, <clears throat> the two spatial effects that we can consider are spatial heterogeneity and spatial dependence. And I just want to say a few weird words about this before later on in the week we'll get into the specifics. Um, heterogeneity is structural change. So what is that? If we model, um, we estimate a regression say we're interested in the effect of some house characteristic like the size of the garage on the price of the house. Is that effect constant throughout space? Or in cer certain neighborhoods, the garage is worth more than in other neighborhoods. That's the kind of thing that we try to model when we deal with spatial, het spatial heterogeneity. Now this is just a special case of heterogeneity structural change, heteroskedasticity, unstable functional forms, those kinds of things. What makes it spatial is that we'll exploit information about the spatial structure to model this. The other thing that complicates matters, as I already alluded to, is that it's hard to distinguish spatial heterogeneity from spatial correlation. The spatial dependence part is two-dimensional and multi-directional and there's a feedback, there's a simultaneity. That makes it very different from time series. Time series goes from the past to the future. There is no coming back. In space, there is a coming back. You go back and forth. And this bouncing around in space is the major qualitative difference between time series analysis and spatial analysis. And it's something that requires us to impose more structure on the process this is where the spatial weights come into play or distance functions come into play. And it's something you always have to remember. And this is why standard techniques like ordinary least squares regression or some time series approaches are not proper in a spatial context. In, in some literature, for example, you might see a test for spatial autocorrelation that uses a time series test, like a Durbin-Watson test, on US states in alphabetical order. And so the alphabetical order mimics the time dimension. Well, that's not spatial autocorrelation. Space doesn't work by alphabet. It works by location, by where the states are located. So you can't just use these, even though, you know, of course you can, in a mechanical sense, use time series techniques for spatial analysis it's not appropriate because it ignores the location and more importantly it ignores the feedback effects that happen in in space. Dr. Can, can you have cross-sectional dependence and multi-directional dependence that interacts over time? Yes you can. So like like uh, economic inequality? Right and when you bring in the time dimension um, things get more complicated because you have, uh, say, you can have cross-sectional interaction that remains constant over time. Or you can have time interaction that remains constant across space. Or you can have space-time interaction, where the, either the cross-sectional interaction changes as we move over time, or the time interaction changes as we move across space. The tricky part in modeling this is to tell one from the other. And typically the, the approaches one takes is, it's called separability. So you have a separate model for the cross-section interaction and for the time series interaction, and then somehow pull them together, and out of this pulling together comes a space-time interaction. And we'll deal with that in the Frontiers workshop where, um, you know, in a lot, if you can think of it as say two, two covariance matrices. One is 
of dimension n by n, where n is the cross-sectional dimension, and the other one is of dimension t by t, where t is a time series dimension. And then you take these two covariance matrices and somehow bring them together in some kind of cross product or some, some formal way. And then from this combination, you actually get a space-time correlation by putting the two together. That's the standard way. If everything changes everywhere and always, again, we're in trouble. This is the generalization of the Tobler thing. Everything depends on everything else at any time, anywhere. Right? So the solution to that is structure. And so either you structure space separately from time and then bring them together, or you have a metric for space-time interaction. And that's very tricky. What is a proper metric? Not just distance in space, but also distance in time and the combination of the two. So true space-time models are very rare. Typically, you get them from combining the, the two. Would you be uh, attempting to determine the direction of causality or, uh, in, in, in spatial dependence? Or just assume, because it wouldn't necessarily be a symmetrical effect on each other, would it? It doesn't have to be symmetrical. Now, a covariance matrix will also will always be symmetrical, but the process that gets you there, and we'll see that tomorrow, how different processes yield spatial covariance matrices. Those processes don't have to be symmetrical. The, the issue with causality is very tricky, because in space you have simultaneity, and it's not so much an issue of causality, it's more an issue of identification. How can you tell one parameter from another parameter? For example, if you have a spatial parameter and a time parameter and they are multiplied together, then you can estimate, you can estimate the product, but you cannot estimate the separate components. So a lot of what we'll be talking about will be related to identification. How, what type of models do our data support? And of course, the richer the data, you know, space-time is richer than pure cross-section, the more complex models can be supported. And sometimes the data are so poor that you, know, you can only support very simple models with huge structure. And of course, if that structure is not right, then everything is wrong too. So the bottom line is, as always, the more information, the better. You know. but a lot of what we'll be talking about is how you deal with situations of insufficient information. The insufficiency primarily being the lacking time dimension where you have a, a pure cross-section. <clears throat> Let me close this introductory um, discussion by just giving you a quick sense of the two main models. The one being the spatial lag model the other one being the spatial error model. So the spatial lag model is something that relates um, a phenomenon at a particular location. Here in the equation, we call it y at location i, to a very general function g of the same y at locations j. So very generically, this says some phenomenon, say house price depends on the same phenomenon, house price, at other locations, as well as on some other factors, the excess. So we model the price of a house by the price of neighboring houses and the square footage, the yard size, garage space, fireplaces, bathrooms, all the usual stuff. Those are the excess. The price of the other houses are in here, are, are in the G a function. This is also referred to as a mixed regressive spatial autoregressive model. The mixture being the x is the regressive part, the y is the autoregressive part. Auto meaning regressing on yourself. So you regress price on price in neighboring locations or in other locations, as well as on the usual covariance, which is the regressive part. In a linear model, uh, it looks something like this, where this W is the spatial weights matrix that we'll spend quite a bit of time on uh, later on. 
And this summarizes this interaction. The G function is too complex. So we make it linear. We make it a simple weighted average, basically, of the neighboring locations. That's um, the linear form of this model. We'll, we'll spend a lot of time on this tomorrow. I just want to put this up now so you have some reference. How do we interpret this? We, we basically have two interpretations. One is what I call a spatial multiplier. The other one is a spatial filter. The multiplier is a model for externalities, for spillovers. What it tells you is what happens if I change something with the x, with the covariates, in one location? How does that affect the y's in all the locations? You, so you see on the left-hand side, there's y, there's a dependent variable, say the prices of our houses. On the right-hand side, we have x, which are the characteristics of the houses. So we have floor space, yard space, and so on. But not just of the house that I'm looking at, also of the neighboring houses. So what happens to the floor space in a neighboring house affects my house price. So if the neighbor puts in a fireplace, my house price goes up, not only the neighbor's house price. This is the multiplier effect. So if you do something in particular locations in the system, it affects not just that, those locations, but it affects the whole system. And tomorrow we'll see more formally how exactly this works, but this is something that is a formal translation of, again, Tobler's law. Everything depends on everything else. Closer things more so. The row in there is a parameter that is smaller than one. We typically power this, so as you power this and move further away, it becomes less and less important, which is our distance decay. The second interpretation is more of a fix when we have data that are not cooperating. When the data are highly spatially correlated, the bottom line is, especially if this is positive spatial correlation, the bottom line is that there is less information in that data sample than we think there is if we use traditional methods. So we need to correct for that. And the correction is, if you wish, the counterpart of detrending in a time series. It's detrending in a spatial sense. And that we refer to as spatial filtering. We'll see that more specific in more detail tomorrow. The upshot of it is, is that we apply some transformation to the dependent variable, which in a sense takes out the spatial autocorrelation. Now the tricky part to this is that there is a parameter involved, this row parameter, which we need to estimate together with the rest of the data. And that will be a complication. In, in time series, you just take first differences. There's no parameter involved at all. In space, you can't take first differences. First differences imply a parameter value for rho of 1, which is, as we will see, an unacceptable parameter value. You cannot have 1. If you have 1, everything depends on everything else equally strongly. And that we can't have. So because we can't just stick in a value, we have to estimate this parameter together with the other ones. That is a qualitatively different situation from the time domain. So that's uh, where things get complicated and where we will have to use explicit spatial regression techniques to get at an estimate for this row parameter. What happens if we ignore uh, spatial lag dependence? And um, what I've done here is simulated a model with a spatial lag. So this gives us a data pattern of, of y's. And then we carry out a regression, and a standard regression on one regression coefficient, a beta parameter. So when there is no spatial autocorrelation, the beta should be 1. And that is the curve, uh, the, the one centered, the dark blue one centered on 1. And then we start cranking up the spatial autocorrelation. And what happens is that the distribution of this estimate in our simulation starts to change. Not only do you see the curve dropping, which means that the variance goes up, so there's a larger spread around the, the mean estimate, but also the mean starts moving out. So the estimate for your beta, for your slope coefficient, is wrong. 
when there is spatial correlation present of the lag variety. So that means that everything you do ignoring the spatial autocorrelation will basically be wrong. Yes. In fact, that is exactly what spatial filtering does. So if you have a problem where your unit of measurement is much smaller than the phenomenon, let's say you have a city-wide phenomenon that truly acts at the city scale, and you have census tracts, then all these census tracts with respect to that phenomenon will essentially be highly spatially correlated. And so they don't really provide you any f information about something that happens at the city scale. And what you need to do to draw proper conclusions, statistics is all about quantifying uncertainty. So you want to have the proper quantification of uncertainty. And to do that, you have to filter out this spatial correlation. And then your estimates for your betas will properly reflect the uncertainty in the data. So uh, the essence of the problem is that with positive spatial autocorrelation, you already know something about the next observation from the observation that you had. Because the neighbors tell you something about the next neighbor. So these are not two independent pieces of information. In fact, they should be deflated. And that's exactly what the filtering does. It, in a sense, it, it discounts the information value of your sample to properly reflect how much information you really have. Just to put it crudely, let's say there's a lot of autocorrelation, so you have 100 pieces of an information. They're really only worth 60 pieces. And so if you do your regression using all well, 100, that's really not as much as you think it is. It is only as much as using 60 pieces. So either you use 60 pieces that are uncorrelated, or you use all 100 and do a statistical adjustment to get it back to the same measure of uncertainty as you would have with the 60. I understand that that's sort of you know, an, an analog to a sample pseudo replication of ecological design or the designs. But what if you have a citywide phenomenon that you anticipate will affect, let's say, households in different yeah, the key factor is if you have citywide phenomena that affect individual units heterogeneously. If they affect them homogeneously, we're in trouble. But the heterogeneity gives us a handle to model this. And then, in fact, we may not need to do the filtering because the heterogeneity will give us a handle on it. It's similar in spirit. It's similar in spirit. And when you have village information in, in a cluster, for example, then you need to correct the standard errors. Uh, it's similar in spirit in that it allows you to get the proper standard errors on the beta coefficients. So if we go back to the previous slide, um, you see the regression model in the spatial filtering setup, the way it's set up, you have everything that's spatial on the left-hand side. And the x beta is on the right-hand side. So if your main interest is on getting proper standard errors for the beta, this is how you accomplish that. By taking out the spatial order correlation and, in a sense, create a new dependent variable, say y star, 
and then that y star is used in a regression where the standard errors for the beta will properly reflect the presence of the state spatial autocorrelation. So they will be different from one a situation where you go at it like this and you ignore the spatial autocorrelation. And that is illustrated by my little simulation here. If you ignore the spatial autocorrelation and it's there, then this is what happens to your estimate. So your beta estimate, if there's a lot of spatial autocorrelation, so this is a, a fairly extreme situation, you're not even close to one. And your standard errors are not even close to what they should be. So that, that is the bottom line. By applying this filtering, and we just call it filtering. Basically, we don't actually do this. We estimate a model where the spatial lag, which we'll talk about more tomorrow, is on the right-hand side. Because we need an estimate for that row together with the estimate for the beta. So the spatial filter is, in a sense, a way to interpret this when there is no real substantive interpretation for a model of contagion or spillover, where it is more a problem with the data and a problem of the scale of, of um, the scale of the measurement not matching the scale of the process, rather than modeling, say, a copycatting, where one entity sets its tax rates as a function of what the neighbors does, for example, which is a substantive interaction process. So both of these give you the spatial lag model, um, as opposed to the spatial error model, which is really um, deals with what is not in the model specification. See, in the spatial lag model, we put the interaction explicitly in the regression. And we'll talk more about this tomorrow, how, how we do that. <coughs> in an error model, it's an unobserved effect. For example, in house price models, you have neighborhood effects. If you can't quantify them, they go into error term. Because all the houses in the same neighborhood share the same neighborhood effects, the error terms will tend to be correlated within the same neighborhood. This is the same as the cluster idea. You know, If you have clusters of individuals that are all subjected to the same larger effect, say they all go to the same school or they all live in the same neighborhood, then there is something common to them that makes them more correlated than they would be otherwise. And, but it's not measurable. If, if you would, could measure it, you would put it in the model. But you know, it's very difficult to measure culture, for example, or to a uh, sense of community. I mean, it's there. You know it's there. But if you cannot quantify it, it ends up in the error term. And the errors are supposed to be noise. They're supposed to be, have no structure whatsoever. They're supposed to be random. If there is something systematic in the error terms, that messes up our analysis. And so the spatial error approach is to uh, identify when there is something systematic in the errors, specifically spatial autocorrelation, and then, again, correct our standard errors so that they properly reflect the uncertainty in the data. And spatial uh, error model is actually much more relevant in practice than the spatial lag model. Because you don't necessarily, you don't have to have a model for spatial interaction to have to deal with spatial correlation. In the spatial lag model, ideally you have a model for spatial interaction or it's the scale issue. In the spatial error model, this could be a totally non-spatial model. But because the data are cross-sectional, are spatial, you have problems. You have unobserved spatial correlation. Just like in a lot of microanalysis, you have un unobserved heterogeneity. People have different skills. They have different backgrounds that are not measurable, and we deal with the heterogeneity in the error term. Here, this is the common shock idea. You know, people are exposed to similar unobserved phenomena, be but because they're all exposed to it somewhat similarly, these unobserved phenomena that end up in the error term will be correlated, and they shouldn't be. 
The error term should be random noise. There should be no structure in there whatsoever. So when there is structure, we need to take it out. Or we need to correct our standard errors to make sure that they properly reflect the fact that there is this structure in the error term. And that's what a lot of the spatial error analysis is about. And to illustrate this, uh, let me take this example, which is a similar simulation exercise where we act as if we don't know that there is spatial autocorrelation, but the data are in fact spatially correlated. So we crank up the autocorrelation in the error term. What happens, the estimate for the beta stays nicely centered on its proper value. So we don't have a problem of bias. We don't have a problem of inconsistency. We do have a problem of precision. You see the curve is dropping, gets thicker. That means the standard errors go up. So ignoring the presence of spatial autocorrelation in the error term will give us wrong, biased estimates of the precision of our estimate. How does that play? We get wrong standard errors, means we get wrong t values, means we draw the wrong conclusions about significance of the coefficients. So spatial error autocorrelation is a problem of precision. And it's often argued that you can deal with it by just getting a larger data set. And in some asymptotic sense, that is, in fact, correct. As your data set grows, the issue of precision will become less and less of an issue because your information set grows uh, as your data set grows. In, in realistic samples, precision does matter, and it matters especially when you use the estimates of your model in a policy context. Say in a policy context, you estimate, let's just take a hedonic example where you are interested in the effect of a particular characteristic, say characteristic of a house, say um, paint. Okay, So you want to give people subsidies so they can paint their houses. How much are you going to give them? You can figure out in a hedonic model, you paint the house, the value of the house goes up. On aggregate, this gives you an increased tax base. That gives you the money to give to the people to paint their houses. Basically, it's a very simple policy experiment. So what you need to come up with is a good measure of how much this paint is worth in terms of the house price. And typically that's a regression, but the regression is just one, one point estimate. What is important is what is the spread. So if you say you come up with an estimate of a thousand, and it's a thousand plus or minus one dollar, that's very different from a thousand plus or minus seven hundred dollars. And that's where the precision is relevant. Even though it is not, in some sense, maybe not as important as having an, an unbiased or a consistent estimate, which is the problem in the lag case, it is very important in, in policy context. Because that wedge, that spread, is all related to the precision of your estimate. And how much you can do with your estimates is also related to that. And so in a lot of cases, there is way too much focus on the point estimate. And you tend to forget that what really matter, matters is the range around this point estimate. And that is where the spatial error techniques uh, come into play. So, yeah. Is my intuition right that in an OLS world, those curves would all be nice, regular, normal curves? So why are they sort of funny shaped? Oh, they're funny shaped because they're based on simulation. So if I, I think I ran about a thousand. Uh -huh. If I ran a hundred thousand, they would be nice, smooth, much smoother. Okay. Now, the one that would be smooth would be the central one because that's the one that follows the, the standard assumptions. When you throw in spatial effects, one of the things that um, I'll talk about a little bit is that these curves look very different. And they're no longer necessarily normally distributed nor are they, no, I mean, they have bumps and things like that. Reflecting the spatial pattern. Exactly, yeah. 